This is a production of Cornell University. Okay. Uh, thank you for coming. My name is Catherine Kinchelow, and this is Soon Ho Kim. We both work for IFPRI, uh, and today we're, kinda, we're going to present about uh, AgriDep and agridep.org, uh, and we're going to talk about the technology that we use uh, to run it. Uh, this is also a paper that we're, we worked with with Yuan Gao, who is currently at the IMF. So I know there have been several other IFPRI presentations, and most of you know who CG is and who IFPRI is, but uh, just a quick overview. There are 15 CG centers over, around the world, and IFPRI is one of them. Uh, the overall goal is to examine the future of food security. Uh, so for IFRI, our home office is in Washington, D.C., and we look at food security mostly through economic development uh, and, and uh, policy research. So what is AGRIDEP? Uh, it stands for the African Growth and Develop Development Policy Modeling Consortium. Uh, the goal with AGRIDEP uh, is to form a network for African researchers uh, where they can, they, where we have capacity building. So our goals are to give tools to African researchers so that they can take important and prominent roles in development research and in the policy debate. Uh, a lot of the policy debate comes from outside of Africa and we think it's, it's important to have more of a role inside of Africa. So how do we do this? We provide tools through economic uh, modeling systems, databases, we provide resources, we provide grant, uh, grant money, we provide training, um, and then we also have this network, both uh, virtually, and then we, uh, we provide a network where they can collaborate in training. So right now, uh, on the website, we feature 15 models. Most of them are housed directly on agridep.org. Um, a lot of them were created specifically for us. Uh, for the external ones, we just provide members access. Uh, and one of those is the GTAP model, if you uh, know anything about economic trade. Uh, we have over 200 data sets uh, and almost 500 resources. Uh, a lot of the data sets and resources, we point to external sources um, to avoid copyright issues. Um, we do have some, some data sets and resources uh, specifically for AgriDep members, uh, and those are reserved solely for them. Um, so some of those resources are state of, state of training manuals. We created a state of training class uh, for our AgriDep members. That's one of our resources. We also have technical notes that usually go with the models. Um, and right now we have 154 members. Um, mostly males, it's about 35% uh, female, uh, so that could use some improvement, but that's where we are right now. Um, to become a member, you have to be a citizen of an African country, and you have to currently live in Africa. Um, so those are our main requirements. And you also have to have an interest in, in policy and economic development. Um, thank you, Catherine, to introduce the AgroDev project. Um, maybe. Um, now let's talk about the technical aspect on the AgroDev website. Uh, actually, I focus on two things today, content management side and then AgroDev outreach side. Actually, in, in terms of content management, we have uh, Drupal as a content management system and Google Analytics as analyzing the data. Uh, and the content and content measure, we just uh, grab some external data source into the AgroDev website. It's talking about the Drupal as number. So we have 7 million uh, websites using Drupal and 120,000 registered users and then 15,000 contribute to model, which, which means free. And then we have five different regions we choose Drupal. The first one is the taxonomy. They have a powerful taxonomy. Second one is they have ability, you can use agrovoc as tagging method. And third one is 
it's very good to build complex uh, structures. And fourth is, as you know, RDF is format of link open data. Drupal 7, they put RDF as in core of the Drupal. So you don't have to do anything for RDF. And they also have a wide community to support. That's why we choose Drupal. Let's take a look at our website. So here is, we have five pillars on the website, the model, data, resource, event, and network, which uh, Catherine explained very well. So here is, we have a photo gallery. Actually, we have uh, many uh, seminars and workshops going on. We took some kind of video file, we upload in the YouTube, and the link in, embedded into our website. So this is from YouTube, and you have also AgroDev channel on YouTube. The training course is a very important activity in our website. So actually, we try to offline training course into online website. So we announce our training course on the website. And then we have application form with a, a Drupal. So we, uh, the agro member fill out form. The inter interesting is actually the some training course requires some kind of statistical skills such as data. So we have an uh, online test tool. So we have a, the main page of the Stata test. And here, look, see, this is my profile. And you see here, I, I cannot pass Stata program test tool. So each, each user can see what status they have on terms of uh, online test. So I will try to pass this test later. <laughs> okay, here is kind of a multi-choice uh, multi of the question. So I have some question and the people answer it and have some time limit. So if, if time is end, test is end. Based on the test and based on the application form, we choose the person who attended the uh, training course. So let's move on to Google Analytics. So Catherine will explain it. Uh, so I handle the monthly log reports for AgriDep. Uh, I monitor our web traffic and Google Analytics is a great way to do that because it's free. Um, and it packages data in a really, really nice way. Um, so it has good visualization tools. You can create entire reports using Google Analytics um, and just download, download those and submit them to, a, to whoever has to look at them. Um, you can also download raw data if you would like, but usually uh, I take screenshots and then uh, use another uh, Word document and create our log reports. So you can just create maps like this, a couple clicks, very, very easy. Uh, for us, uh, it's really important to be able to pull out target groups. Uh, since we're mostly focused on our African members, we want to focus on our traffic that comes out of Africa. Um, so you can pull out this traffic for anything. You can find African mobile users. Uh, you can find how, what their load times are for the pages, which is really important. Um, and here you can just see this is our source, our source traffic broken down uh, into three categories, all visits, external traffic, which is all traffic outside of the Washington, D.C. area, since that's where we monitor or where we maintain the website, and then Africa-only traffic. Uh, it's also a great way to identify any problems or things that we need to work on or maybe things that uh, we can manipulate to improve our traffic uh, and make sure we're, we're, we're reaching the, the correct users. So this was our traffic from June. Uh, we normally have these kind of peaks and valleys. The valleys are the, always on the weekends and then we have a peak on Monday. Uh, <laughs> most people don't work on the weekend apparently. <laughs> Um, so we normally release a newsletter every month, and we aim for the middle of the month, but this past month we decided to release it later. Uh, and then you can see this huge spike in traffic right there uh, for that day and the day after when we release the newsletter. So we can see just how important uh, that newsletter is for us. So we can uh, make sure we release it in a timely manner, and then we can also know that we should be sending other emails, uh, especially to our members. Okay, so let's talking about uh, some kind of content mashup. Actually, uh, nowadays API is very important, so we can grab some data from outside and uh, spread it into the, the website. Actually, the AgroDev uses the same technology. 
So actually, we ask, request some data to uh, our uh, data uh, organization, um, data creator, such as uh, World Bank for GDP, FAO for agricultural land and population, the IFRI for global hunger index, especially the IFRI knowledge management team provide the link open data for global hunger index, we easily incorporate in our website. Um, any question? <laughs> okay, then the land matrix from the, okay, land matrix from the, um, actually the land graphing is now, now, right now is a very uh, hot issue, so we can add the land matrix there. So here is kind of implementation. You can see some kind of the data from World Bank. This, this is the country Kenya. And then we have some kind of land deal. 19 land deal is ongoing on in Kenya in 2013 until now. So let's talk about AgroDev outreach. So we are using the social media, schema.org, and newsletter. In the social media, we have uh, LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter. Especially, we focus on more uh, LinkedIn because it's a professional network uh, communication. So actually, we uh, add some activity and members and promote some content here. And also, we have Facebook, and then we also use, use Twitter. So we can tweet about some kind of our activities such as grant. And then also, we are doing some schema or implementation in the website. When you see here the, in the top, you can see it's like a human version of the, the user profile. But when you, when you go to the, the here, this is for machine. So you can add some schema.org presentation uh, uh, vocabulary here. So see, machine can understand this is photo, this is a first name, last name, this is a from uh, where this uh, people, uh, person are from, and there's some kind of description about the biography. Last one is a, a newsletter. As usual, the many um, projects and organizations, they are doing, uh, create the newsletter monthly basis. So we do something, uh, we do the uh, MailChimp first, then we realize some kind of feedback from user do not incorporate into our web uh, traffic. So we kind of do some kind of simple ex experiment how to, in how to increase this kind of back traffic into the, the website. So we create the newsletter and upload the newsletter into server, and then we, in, inside Drupal, we send the email to user, specify some kind of group. And then in that email link, uh, that email only include the link and small description, which means user, user likely to click on the link and go back to AgroDev uh, portal. So we have some significant, significant increase of the web traffic from here. So next step, so we definitely we do more mashup later and bring some up-to-date data to user. And we also doing, using a lot of webinar. So we have some small group inside of AgroDev, such as Impact Evaluation Group. So we can use a webinar tool to have a more communication, debate, and discussion together. And also we are doing um, some research-based network. Not only Facebook, not only LinkedIn, we can use a research gate. So we, we encourage the member to register research gate and they get some kind of feedback from research gate directly. But they have impact factor, they have uh, their distant publication, so we can incorporate this kind of data into the website. Now it's time to I'm proudly introduce our members. So these are all our members. Some of them. <laughs> some of them, yeah. <laughs> and then here is our website. So please visit our website, increase our visibility. Thank you very much. My name is Claudine Gianda from Auburn University Libraries. And I'll talk about the uh, online chat service that our university library instituted. Uh, we instituted it about uh, t 10 years ago and have not had a chance of assessing how well it's meeting the needs of our students, faculty, and staff, including all other library users. Some background information. Auburn is uh, located to the southeastern part of the U.S., near Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, it's a land-grant university that was established in 1856. 
And as a land grant, uh, it is a very comprehensive university offering many programs of instruction, research, and engineering, agriculture, sciences are among some of our strongest programs. The university library that serves the university is a research level library. There are about 100 such libraries in the US. And here we have a little bit of the matrix, has about 8 million volumes, and we are making efforts to add electronic journals, electronic, uh, electronic e-books as well with our address. The reference services that we provide um, are offered at one main central reference desk. We were centralized in 1999 as part of the cost cutting, uh, as a cost cutting strategy. Previously, our library, which is a five story building, had uh, reference services in each, on each floor, sciences on the fourth floor, social sciences third, humanities and government documents. But in 1999, we were all centralized and Reference is provided in person, via phone, via email, many different ways to provide reference. And in 2000, the year 2000, we provided also online chat service. It's open to students and faculty. We do not require any authentication, so anyone can access this. We, we indeed have users, traffic, Google Analytics coming from all over the world. And as a land grant university, that's important to us. We want farmers, we want members of the community to all benefit from our reference service. The chat service we selected is HumanClick, uses, uh, uh, uses HumanClick software. Also, you also hear it called uh, InfoChat. It's mostly text-based and features some automatic archiving of every reference question that's answered. There are features for having canned messages, like you know, each time a chat comes, you don't always have to say hello, you can have already created messages that greet uh, patrons in a standard manner. You also can share files, that's very important. That allows us to send a link that has a PDF to a student who is having trouble accessing or searching our, de uh, our website. In this study, we wanted to analyze the type of chat transcripts that the system captured. And we had done a, a beginning study in 2001 that gave us some baseline data. And, but since 2001, we've just been busy interacting with our users, not knowing exactly what's going on in the chat. So this study wanted to figure out even things like, you know, how many chats do we receive per year? How many of those are directional questions and how many are reference questions? Are these questions being answered successfully? Are people going away with you know, the answer they wanted? If, if not, what are the factors that contribute to unsuccessful charts? Altogether, in this study, we uh, analyzed about 1,500 chat sessions. And that is approximately less than 5% of our total volume of reference. On average, our estimates of reference questions are about 266 per day. And these were our main findings. When we started this study, we thought we'd be doing a lot of innovative work, but it looks like a lot of it is just counting, counting, counting numbers. How many questions and how many are successful? Uh, about 400 questions were captured in this nine month period, and 933 of those were actually reference questions. I included on this chart, on this chart 
on this table uh, disconnects some users who, who activate our system and then don't ask a question. And also this includes uh, when we are in classes, we are showing the system to our students that some of these disconnects are also uh, part of that. But a big focus is on uh, directional and reference questions. When we focus just on the reference questions, those numbers again, the 70, 30, came up again. And that other studies have also found um, successful questions, questions answered successfully when we study each question and the patron goes away, uh, about 70% were answered in a more successful manner. 30% failed. This is the same result, uh, just a, a, a plot. It also corresponds with our semesters, September to, Nov to December, August to December, that's our busy fourth semester, and also the April, May, June there, the spring semester is also busy, and then uh, summer months are a bit lighter traffic. For the questions that failed, the main reasons when we look at them had to do with the collection co that contributed to lack of uh, successful success in, in a reference transaction more times than any other cause. We have gaps in the collection each time we've done serial reviews that sometimes may be exactly the journal that a person wants. Our library has a policy of not adding textbooks. That too causes some um, reference failure. Until last year, we did not have dissertations and thesis full text that um, would also contribute to failure. Embargoes that publishers give, you know, we subscribe to a journal, but you can't access the latest year, that contributes to a Quite, quite a number of failures. As we looked at these, uh, the unsuccessful questions, poor reference interview was also a contributor to failure. Uh, occasionally we saw difficult questions, uh, very difficult questions that someone is trying to answer through chat. And since we are a centralized reference desk, the chance that someone will ask a question and find a, a librarian with that subject expertise has been reduced a great deal. So if an engineering student is trying to uh, contact chat and at the desk, we try to have a social science, science and uh, humanities librarian at least three. If you don't have the right uh, librarian with the knowledge, subject knowledge, that can contribute to uh, failure of uh, reference chart. There are technical problems as well, especially with our students, uh, adult learners, continuing education, that sometimes happens, or simply because it's technology. A couple of questions that failed were, were because of uh, unrealistic user expectations. I'm not sure if your university is like mine. I think all our students, definitely the undergraduate student population expects everything to be a PDF and hopefully it will be there right then. And it becomes a disappointment when you have to tell them, no, we, we need to get this in paper format or from another library. Then, you know, uh, that can contribute to failure. So this, uh, sort of sums up some of our main findings. 72% of references answered successfully. And of those questions, a high proportion was for items that are known, known items, either we have a citation and someone needs to find the PDF. Usually they've been searching Google or some, somewhere 
if they can't link to APDF, then they will contact us. And high proportion were high, uh, I, non item searches. There was a high number of policy questions, people clarifying policies like uh, circulation questions that they have, I would say at about 30% also. The promotion of our service um, has been done mostly through classes like English classes. We've not done any, any major pro promotion. And through seeing, looking at these questions, it looks like there's some, something, these services of use to clientele such as these ones, remote faculty and students when they are away on internships or at conferences and also our students who are off campus. So a need to promote this service would be good. Having 30% 30 30 fail, failure rate in reference for Auburn is actually a very shocking figure. You all are very quiet in here, but I think at Auburn that's not good enough. Um, our university library strives to provide excellent service, as is the case, I'm sure, in your institutions too. When we do user groups, uh, focus groups, reference service is uh, an area where we are well known for providing very good service. And this study is revealing something troubling. 30% to us is a bit uh, much higher than we would expect. We're expecting in the 90% range. So this study is sort of revealing on how re reference transactions actually occur. An important recommendation of this study would be not to wait 10 years, as has been the case, before you do an analysis of your chart. Start looking at it probably every month if you can. Otherwise, every semester would be good. And um, our users always give us fantastic indications on types of services and technology that they seem to need. To address the collection inadequacy, uh, we, if we study each of the charts, there may be some journals that we can buy as single one-time purchases, and that might reduce our failure rate. Uh, for lack of proper reference interview, cross-training so that our reference librarians can see the type of transactions, uh, the, the way they answer questions, using some examples from that for cross-training, I think would help us. And I think uh, this study is showing we need to do a thorough RUSA guidelines type uh, study on how RUSA guidelines are being applied in a chat session. When I talked about excellent uh, user service, reference service, a part of that is also, in addition to answering, giving the, the most relevant uh, information, high quality information, we have a reference philosophy, a, a guideline for using every reference tr transaction as a place where we also can teach one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, that's a philosophy that we do very well when the people come and work with us in person. Over the phone, we usually will explain how we are answering a question. When we study the uh, if one-on-one, one-on-one -on -one instruction is happening in the chat session, this gave us one of the most shocking results we found only 14% of the charts included the librarian giving the correct answer and also trying to show how they, how they conducted the reference interview. So um, this 14% only include, are the ones that included one-on-one -on -one instruction. That's something we obviously need to uh, address. And uh, one observation we're thinking maybe in a chat session, it doesn't lend itself very well to teaching someone. We think maybe chat is really high paced. And as we, you study each transcript, the process of answering a question was always interesting. The librarian would receive the question 
and almost all the time there was a line to the effect, wait a minute, let me check very quickly. And the librarian will go in a database or somewhere, do the searching, find an answer, and then quickly give the person the answer, but they do not show the reference search process. So there, there may be room for training, and I think it's something we need to focus on. Um, we have some additional recommendations here that we'll, we'll be trying to follow through. Um, but out of this, we feel like chat is allowing us, we can't take it for granted anymore that we provide excellent service. It's actually showing us the reality of what that service is like, and we'll be looking at ways to uh, improve that. The reference questions, the majority that come in had to do with patrons needing help with search strategy. And another high proportion had to do with patrons needing to know a library database or library resource. They would have been searching on Google when they failed to find what they want. This chat service, a high proportion of the questions we were matching them, pointing them to a library database that they did not know. Uh, so search strategy or uh, looking up a database, uh, all those were among those uh, questions that are asked for the most. And uh, non-item searches that I indicated earlier. That's the extent of the study at this point. We hope to do more work on it, thank you. Many thanks to CTA and ITOCA for the sponsorship. My presentation is on the title, I Culture Innovation Systems Among um, Small Scale Pineapple Farmers in the Equipim South Municipal Assembly in Ghana. This study essentially tries to look at um, an aid program given by the US government to the uh, people of Ghana. By way of introduction, I'm going to quickly run through, by way of outline, I'm going to quickly run through the study introduction right through to the objectives of the study and results and conclusion of the study. Um, now, this aid program I'm talking about is what is known as the Millennium Challenge Account Program, MCA. Now, this is uh, a shift in the way US actually administers its aid program in that, um, this was an aid program instituted by um, President George Walker Bush in March 2002, and this is actually um, being administered by the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which is based in Washington, D.C. Now, the MCA is actually given to countries that actually govern justly and invest in their citizenry and encourage economic freedom. The MCA essentially administers two types of grants, which is known as the Compact and the Threshold Program. A Compact is a multiple year agreement between MCC and, a, and an eligible country. The Threshold, on the other hand, essentially tries to make available smaller financial grants to countries that miss narrowly on indicators that were set forth by the um, MCC to bridge such gaps. MCC has so far approved over 8.4 billion US dollars in both the compact and threshold programs in broad areas such as health, education, agriculture, and governance. In line with this, um, Ghana had a five-year compact of 547 million dollars, which was targeted essentially um, through the modernization of agriculture through the private sector-led growth. In 2006, against this backdrop, there were the creation of um, farmer-based organization and the strengthening of already existing um, FBOs that were in, in the system. FBOs are essentially um, bigger umbrella bodies that in, include cooperative society, farmer organizations, um, principally formed to provide input services, marketing and educational services for its members. Another media program, various capacity programs were put in place to actually try to improve upon farmers' efficiency. Now, 
these capacity programs essentially were geared towards um, trying to bring about certain new ideas or innovations among farmers and other stakeholders. Innovation can either be defined as technology nor science by the successful application of um, knowledge of various kinds to achieve expected economic and social benefits. And the emphasis here is the, on the final application of the knowledge being used. Um, here are two. Farmers were always placed at the receiving end where knowledge was just generated by research and handed over to farmers. Um, an extension approach which has received much critique um, by most authors in the past, and which they define as the transfer of technology. Now, this made way for um, a more um, flexible approach which included much more actors within the innovation systems in what was known as the agricultural knowledge and information systems, ACIS. Currently, the thinking is the agricultural innovation systems, which actually is the outcome of the process of networking and interactive learning among various heterogeneous actors, such as farmers, input industries, traders, researchers, extensionists, civil society in general, in the generation of knowledge. Justification for the study, the, there appears to be very little empirical research um, conducted in this area, which essentially tries to look at the large scale program of the scope of um, the Millennium Challenge Account Program um, in ascertaining whether it actually tries to stimulate innovations among smallholder farmers. Objectives of the study, um, the study tries to look at the extent to which the media program aligns with the AIS concept, establish factors that affect farmers' innovation behavior, and examine the role played by MIDA in the innovation system and processes. And finally, to identify the types of innovations used by farmers and other stakeholders as a result of the MIDA program and examine the extent to which um, this has led to increases in outputs. Um, this presentation actually zeroes in on the second research objectives, uh, which looks at the factors that affect farmers' innovation behavior and examine the role played by uh, MIDA. Um, Essentially, the research questions posed here are how do farmers innovate, what challenges do farmers face in innovating, and what extent do farmers use innovate, innovations. The study area is the Crapping South Municipal Assembly, which is um, actually um, just located, um, sorry. It's actually located in the eastern region, um, part of Ghana, which is 23 kilometers away from the Greater Accra, um, the capital city of Ghana. And this is made up of the um, semi-deciduous forest and the coastal savanna um, ecological zone. Methodology, the study employed the mixed methods approach which made use of the um, survey instruments and the qualitative um, instruments such as focus group discussions and key informant interviews. Sampling procedure, um, generally the study made use of the simple random, um, sampling was at two stages, first at the farmer base um, organization level, FBO's level, and also the selection of the farmers. So the simple random select, um, sampling procedure to select the FBO's and also to select for the um, farmers within the FBO's. Um, in total, there were, there, there were a total of 115 um, MIDA FBO members and 17 non-MIDA FBO members for the um, survey instrument. Five um, focus group discussions were conducted for the MIDA FBOs and um, two focus group discussions for the non-MIDA FBOs. In all, there were 20 key informant interviews. Uh, this is a brief overview of the social demographic characteristics of the MIDA FBOs. Um, age range from 35 to 50 years, and um, generally an educational level of middle school living certificates to no formal education. The non-MIDA FBOs, however, had an um, educational status of um, middle school living certificates, senior secondary school um, living certificates, and no formal education with an age range of 35 to um, 55 years. Result of the study, um, how do farmers innovate? 
farmers essentially, both the MIDA and non-MIDA FBOs, um, innovate through trainings that they receive from a key sector ministry known as the Food, Ministry of Food and Agriculture, MOFA, and NGOs such as um, um, TIPC, GTZ, which is currently known as um, GIZ. And um, trainings that they receive, farmers sometimes modify this training to suit their own farming needs. Um, in, in this area, and a key informant interview that I had with uh, an agronomist of a, an agribusiness within the study area, I quote directly from him, he said that um, farmers actually do everything. They will try hands on any ideas which brings about economic benefits to them, unquote. Um, in this regard, farmers are essentially trying to make um, very good economic returns out of any idea which comes into their mind. Another way through which farmers, both categories of farmers innovate is through experimentation. Um, they experiment various ideas, and in this regard, they usually would allocate some portion of their farmland to try some ideas which come into mind. Um, with experimentation, farmers um, in their cultivation of the pineapple crop usually induce it, try to um, hasten the ripening period with the use of calcium carbide. That has been the usual practice, but some farmers add kerosene to the calcium carbide in forcing. And this is something which they experimented to find out that during the rainy season, the kerosene tries to hold the calcium carbide in place to prevent runoff. Through observation, farmers, both categories of farmers, um, innovate through observation, through discussions, and accidental discovery that they find out on their farms. And also as a result of contact with big commercial farms. This is a bar graph which shows the extent to which both categories of farmers innovate. And um, you could see here that um, the non-MIDA FBOs do not actually use plastic mulch and the MD2 pineapple variety, which is currently um, on higher demand on the export market. Effects of the MIDA program, um, it had both positive and negative effects. The positive effects were made manifest in the area of better marketing on the part of the MIDA FBO members. They, even before they go into farming, they want to secure market for their produce before they go into their pineapple farming. They want to compare um, the prices of agricultural input from different market outlets before they um, actually purchase, made final purchases, and also having a common price within the farmer-based organization. They also made sure that they had contractual agreements with the exporters, and mostly the MIDA FBOs were more diversified in their farming activities and also employed the use of um, tractor. The negative effects were essentially um, felt in the area of um, you know, great, greater hype that the government then gave to the program. Farmers had higher expectation from the program and other stakeholders as well. So some farmers had to essentially come together just to reap the benefits of the program, but not to actually um, have the benefits of the program um, as it were or as it may be. Um, very few FBOs, there were a total of about um, 14 FBOs within the area, and just two FBOs received credit from the media program, but that was the main expectation of the program in the minds of most farmers. And this um, already goes to deepen the already existing negative farmer attitude about government programs. The main challenge to innovation by both categories of farmers had been the issue of um, access to farm credits. All what farmers say is that they need money, they need money. Money is an essential thing that they need in order to innovate. Um, that has been the main issue that farmers had raised. But I observed from the study that even though farmers cite credit as the main issue, that, that, that is not actually the issue at stake because given the various ideas and innovations that the program stimulated, even without money or access to credit, 
there, there should be a change in the way farmers you know, go about their usual business. And um, I think that the journey issue here is really with the third point, which has to do with the inappropriate time for which disbursement of credit is done by most large-scale government programs. It is given at the wrong time, and because farming is quite season-dependent, when it comes in at the wrong time, farmers divert it for other non-farming activities. Conclusion. The main ways through which farmers innovate are through trainings received from um, government agencies such as MOFA and NGOs, through experimentation, observation, discussions, accidental discovery, and contact with big commercial farms. The positive effects of the MIDA program were made manifest through better marketing, diversification of farming business, use of tractor for harrowing and plowing, and the use of the MD2 pineapple variety. The negative effects were mainly in the area of the greater expectation that government put forth at the onset of the program. These are the references. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna ask our panelists to come up here, to sit here, and then if you have questions, um, this would be the time for them. We ask that you would come to the microphone to ask your questions so that everyone can hear and that also it can be um, recorded. So we'll give a minute here for everyone to assemble. Thank you. I'm Basil from Uganda. Uh, my question goes to Daniel. Daniel, thank you for the presentation. Uh, you already alluded to the fact that uh, the, the, the participants, the program participants had higher expectations. And therefore, <coughs> I would say that there was a self-selection issue. So it becomes a problem to actually isolate the impact of the program because maybe the good people already self-selected themselves into participating. So when you come to compare the program participants against, against the nanny participants, it, it might turn out that the, that self-selection problem kind of masks the true impact of the program. Uh, uh, do you try to control for self-selection in this study? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your question. I think your question is um, essentially an issue of um, attribution, trying to attribute the observed um, impact or effect of the study to specific, you know, um, you know the issue of self-selection. Um, the creation of the FBUs, and the selection of members for the FBUs was left essentially to the sector ministry, which is the Ministry of Food and Agriculture. So um, farmers were made to create and come together to form their own FBUs, and already existing FBUs were also used. But in my study, I tried to look at um, farmers that um, you know, benefited from the MIDA program and also farmers that did not benefit within the same study area. And I also looked at even within the farmers that benefited, the before and after situation, so that you know, attributing the observed effect could be quite um, reliable. Yeah. Other questions for any of our panelists? I know it's kind of hard at the end of the day. <laughs> okay, well with that, I'm gonna thank everyone for excellent presentations. And if anyone does have further questions, come to the microphone. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Um, my question goes to the, uh, the presenter on e-reference, uh, chat reference. Um, you said the chat reference is open to everybody that's registered and non-registered of the library, users of the library. The registered and non, anybody can access the chat reference and ask questions, is it? That's yeah. what? Yeah, mm. yes. If you find a resource or maybe an information resource for somebody who is not a registered member of the library, maybe the person is looking for uh, a resource, not a directional question, how do you go about giving the information or the resource to the person since the person is not a user, a bona fide user of the library? That's the first question. The, question, the second question is, assuming you find an electronic resource, how do you, if it is in PDF format, do you normally send a PDF? How do you send the PDF or, or do you send the link? These are my two questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Very, very observant. Uh, it's true that we do not require any authentication. We are open to receiving questions from any researcher. Um, it does work out that uh, we can tell, we can, for privacy issues, we do not know exactly who it is that's asking. We can tell roughly the IP address that is coming from the US or coming from Israel or coming from India, many different places. Now, once we get a question, um, the levels of service, we are open to providing the fullest service possible. Uh, if what is needed is an electronic resource and maybe the person needs a PDF, we'll probably let them know uh, what the citation is um, for the journals that we do buy, I'm sure that's the case with other uh, libraries as well, our licenses require that we limit access to only current urban faculty, staff, and students. We have not bought the extended license that might cover an additional region beyond, beyond our institution. So we would probably give a reference citation, then advise the researcher to place a request for an interlibrary loan through their nearest library, and if we end up being the library that has to supply that, we would do that cooperation through interlibrary loan. Uh, so if it's a PDF and if it's um, guided by licenses, it's from a publisher where we bought, a, uh, we bought it under license that's restrictive, then we'll probably just give a citation help the researcher on options. We have other practitioners from other research libraries. How do you all handle that question? You know, those that also have similar requests coming in from non-affiliated. Does anyone want to add comments to that? Uh, I have a question as well as, uh, my name is uh, Deva Reddy, I am from Texas a &M University. I have a question as well as, uh, uh, also answer to your question. Uh, as far as uh, my question is, did you ever try uh, co-browsing, that means uh, connecting to all the databases and other uh, 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 material you have, did you ever try co-browsing as far as this chart reference is concerned? That's my question. And the answer, uh, uh, the other one to answer your question, uh, our experience, I don't know, I forgot your question, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> Is the question we just received a short while ago. If, if you received a request through chat uh -huh. from a user that's not affiliated with your institution, yes. how do you handle that? You uh, have access to a PDF, maybe, that the person wants. No, we, do, we did have that, had that pro problems. Then nowadays, what we do, we ask for the ID. They have to log in with their ID. Of course, it's open to everyone chat, but as far as the uh, accessing our resources is concerned, then we ask for their ID, their net ID, we ask for it. Thank you. Yes, I I'm afraid the re restrictions that we have usually will prevent us from giving the full document. 
Co-browsing is not a feature that at the moment we have in our current chat service. We're in the process of studying many other um, options on software that's available, lib answers, and that might have that feature, but at the moment we, we do not. So we, we usually rely on instructions that we give um, that the patron can replicate those or go with them step by step if we include some instruction. I'll just weigh in here that at Cornell we have chat reference as well and we don't restrict people's access. So if we do get questions about resources and somebody wanting, for example, the PDF for the full text of an article, obviously we, we can't legally give that out to people who aren't. But there's a way to do it without, and what we end up doing is asking for their Cornell email address so that we can send it to them. And that often at that point, they, they will say, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have a Cornell email address. I'm not affiliated. And then we would just have to apologize that they're restricted. And um, that, it's, a, it's a tactful way without having to right up front say, are you Cornell affiliated? You know, you want to, yeah, so. Any other questions for our panelists? Okay, again, let's um, thank them for their presentation. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.